Good work. I'm getting extra pay for that today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll double it. <laughs> well, I don't know. Do you have access? Good. Yeah, I think we're okay here. Uh, all right. Do we see some? We see some scripture there. Yeah. Yes, we do. Okay. All right. Now that we're being recorded, we can uh, try to say all the right things, right? So why don't we? Why don't we begin with our text? Um, we'll pray over that and then then continue on. He, this is being Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created. In heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Lord Christ, be pleased with what we have to say and think today. Show us something of yourself in it, and be glorified in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've been sort of thinking through some... Um, I'm sparing you some math here. Uh, we've been thinking through the... <laughs> but I, I think I heard an amen. That's not okay. Um, <laughs> you did. And a thank you. <laughs> um, we've been thinking through some ideas of, of, of uh, the relationship between chaos and order and, and how that manifests itself in, in the cosmos. Which, which is an ordered world and how the logos, how uh, the, this Christ who, who in whom all things hold together is, is acting on the cosmos to bring about that order. We looked at that through uh, some Pythagorean lenses last week. And now we're going to look uh, at, a, at a different part of the world and uh, an earlier time and, and see what we have here. And again, I'm, I'm always anxious uh, when, when I've got some some proper Bible scholars in the room with me, so I always welcome their um, their their correction and insight, which which I think will be more uh, more mature than my own. But let's let's see what we can what we can discover together. So, of course, we all know we know we all know how how the word begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So this is, we're, we're looking now, we're moving from this, this Greek context into this ancient Near Eastern context. And this is, this is of course, how, how scripture opens. And it describes an earth that is without form and void. Tohu abohu. And, and tohu can be understand as waste or formless, uh, sometimes it can be associated with confusion or or a kind of lack of being, a, a place of chaos, um, a, a kind of unreality. And and when when we say unreal, the way it's used in the Old Testament seems to be connected to 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 um, idols. Idols are unreal in that sense. Um, I I was looking and I wondered if it had something to do with a lack of being, which which may matter for us as we go on here. If, if it represented a kind of lack of being or a lack of existence or something like that, um, I didn't see that as its use in, in the Old Testament, at least. That seems like more like a, a kind of Greek idea, but um, that's the way we see it used in the Old Testament. And then bohu or well, bohu is, is kind of an emptiness or a void. And also relevant to, to our conversation will be this idea of the deep, which is to home. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but these are these are the subterranean waters, uh, the the primeval sea or or the abyss. Um, <laughs> the when I as I as I study this, the 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 sense that I get when we're talking about the deep is it's a spooky place. Um, it's it's a place of chaos and disorder. 
Uh, it's a case where scary things reside, right? Jonah, Jonah is dragged down to, to the deep. Um, Leviathan is in the deep, right? The, the, when, when the flood comes, it's the deep that's that's set loose, right? So that so so the water is coming up and down in the flood. Um, so so th there are there are some kind of overtones with respect to the deep that um, are are foreboding in a certain sense. Um, sure. Well, please. When, when I hear the word heavens, I kind of automatically go to the idea of. Um, you know where God is, and and the promise of heaven for all of us who are believers. What what would have been the understanding then? More of the sky, or something more than just the sky? Yeah, I I my sense is that in in this cosmology, you, you're you're getting levels of heaven. Um, feel free to help me, Manfred. But the the uh, you you've got in the creative act. What God seems to be doing is is taking this kind of primeval waters or stuff or or tohu or bohu and he's he's separating it out vertically and separating waters above from waters below and then then later separating separating it out horizontally and creating land in the midst of it so you, you're getting creation of firmament first that's a vertical separation and then and then land second um and that's a horizontal separation so so the, the heavens are going to be the place sort of, um, it's not clear to me if that's ab above the waters above or if that's um, holding up the waters above, but it's, it's something like that. And I, so, so it, is, it, is it a place where God resides? Maybe that is what your question is. And, and um, my sense is yes, it, it, that, that is where... Um, We've we've got to be a little careful, right? We're always, all of this talk is going to be filled with mystery. So <laughs> the place where God resides, if if God's eternal, um, and and the place where He resides is something that is not Him, then that place where He resides can't precede Him, right? So. And and if the place where he resides is is something that's created again, the the creation can't precede him. So it it gets a little fraught when we're when we're trying to think in categories that are too tight. So and, and even language like the place where he resides is sort of meaningless theologically, right? It's it's the, 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 we're, we're probably we and and the biblical text are going to use anthropomorphic language to help us. Um, try to communicate something that's true about him, but but it's always going to be sort of chock full of mystery too. Um, any, I, I, don't, I don't, Manfred, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, well, I, I was just thinking, um, you know, the way in which the ancients, ancient uh, Israel and the uh, Near Eastern uh, civilizations, the Persians and the Egyptians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, their envisioning of what is beyond what we can feel and know and touch and so on, uh, that is all uh, related to our capacity to, to imagine beyond what may be similar or different from what we know and experience here. Um, uh, uh, an Old Testament scholar, uh, can come up with his name right, uh, Old Testament scholar at Harvard for many years, uh, wrote a book entitled The Old Testament Against Its Environment. That is, it uses the language of the environment and the way in which the environment, the cosmos, was understood. Uh, and uses that kind of language and imagery and understanding within which then to articulate their belief, which is over against. That is what the Old Testament says in the creation account is a polemic against the way in which the universe and reality was understood. Mm. The Old Testament against oh, yeah. this environment. It's a, it's a protest. 
No, the world of out there is not the world like ours with all these pantheons, these rule of the gods. The, the rule of the gods was, uh, was described and understood and perceived as uh, like human society. The, 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 the gods had, had, had sex, they produced children, they killed each other, they were in all kinds of schemes, and they simply reflected the brokenness of human life. And uh, so, so it seems to me when we when we talk about where is God, you know, I think in some ways that's the wrong question. Uh, John Polkinghorne, you probably know know about him, uh, Walt, uh, uh, outstanding uh, British uh, physicist, and uh, uh, he did a lot of work in. Uh, quantum mechanics, which I don't understand at all, but he, po he postulates what he calls a, a parallel universe that exists parallel to ours and interfaces with our universe, but it's, a diff it's of a different order, it's a different kind. So heaven for me, in light of that understanding, I don't understand quantum physics, but heaven for me is not a place, some place out there, but it's, it's being in the presence of God in a different kind of reality. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a helpful segue for us. The, the, we, we talked about pseudo-Dionysus, and, and when, when we were talking about um, the, the logos and what it is and how, how all of the language, all that Pythagorean language is going to fall short of, of the reality, right? Um, and, and the same is going to be true of, true of this um if you if you ask a physicist what an electron is the the answer is kind of ambiguous um even even in even in our sort of physical material reality they'll they'll just tell you that the math works um and it does so so all of this this is is sort of deeply enriched with with mystery um and our own finitude right um so uh Go ahead, I, Ted. I was just I was just uh, reflecting how wonderfully this proceeds and dovetails with uh, John one, one to fourteen. Yeah, the the that that Colossians hymn and John one sit really nicely together. Mm -hmm. uh, the the they're telling they're they're telling us a, this this good glorious story of of. Him who was before all things, and through him all things came into being. Right. Um, so, um, in, in the ancient Near East, the the sort of soup in which the the Israelites were were cooked, um, you're you're getting these these similar creation myths. The the Canaanite myth, where you have Baal defeating Yom. I, I just find this stuff really interesting to read. Yah is this the sea prince, Yom. That is, um, that's that's the Canaanite myth, and and perhaps drawing from a similar tradition is the Enuma Elish, which is the the Babylonian myth that that is the the tablets of the Enuma Elish were found um, later. The, these are seventh century tablets. Um, the god Ea defeats the the sub subterranean water god Apsu. And Marduk, who is who is uh, defeats the mother of all, who is Tiamat, the salt waters. So, so in in both of these myths, I'm I'm really really sort of compressing these. What you're getting is some godlike figure defeating something having to do with water, uh, and and or or the sea or or perhaps something related to what you're getting in, in Genesis related to the deep, right? So the, there, you, this, the, you're getting a theme there of order and disorder, and they're, they're personalized in some way. The, all, all of these natural things are personalized. Um, and so uh, you, you'll come across this term chaos comp, which is the struggle against chaos that's found in, in these mythologies. So in, 
in these cosmologies, what, what creation is doing is largely the ordering of these chaotic forces, the primeval waters or Leviathan or things like that. So, so the creative act is largely taking things that, that existed prior, things that this, this, the, you've got the, the gods that, that begin in, in the Babylonian myth, it's, it's uh, Apsu and, and Tiamat who, who seem to be, um, don't, don't have a beginning. There's, there's not a, there's not a kind of genesis to them. The other gods are, are the result of them combining their waters Tiamat and Apsu combine their waters and the other gods come out of that. Marduk and, and Ea, for example, come out of that. Um, but, but Apsu and Tiamat existed prior and Tiamat is, is sort of representing of this, this chaotic context. So, so you have this pre-existing primordial stuff in these myths, um, some of which is chaotic. And in this case, in this understanding, what God is doing is winning in this mythic combat over them. And cr what, what creation means is, is the defeat of this cosmic battle over chaos and keeping it contained, keeping these chaotic forces, particularly those of water, at bay. For, and, and so the flood is, is an example of God remove because all of these these uh the, the these ancient ancient near eastern creation accounts also have uh similar flood accounts and that's when the the ordering being is is rather than keeping those chaotic forces of water at bay removing that um and allowing them to hold sway right so it raises the question of what the creative act is is it is it material or is it teleological, right? Um, so we're, we're going to keep exploring this a bit. The, uh, 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 an interesting book on this is Levinson. Um, it's called The Creation and the Persistence of Evil, the Jewish Drama of Divine Om Omnipotence. And he says, God sets bounds that the primeval waters must not dare to cross. In each case, the confinement of chaos rather than its elimination is the essence of creation. And the survival of ordered reality hangs upon God's vigilance in ensuring that those cosmic dikes do not fail, that the bars and doors of the sea's jail do not give way, that the great fish does not slip his hook. And what, what you're getting in that kind of description seems to me to be consistent what, with, with what you get Christ doing in Colossians. That is, in, in so far as Christ is holding all things together. So he he seems to be getting, Levinson seems to be getting something right there. Well, the, the purpose of Re Levinson's book is to try to explain the problem of evil and its continued existence. Um, and, and he seems to have it right that, that God or, or the, the, the Logos is keeping disorder or chaos at bay in his holding things together. Um, but one of the things that, as far as I can tell, Levison is not advocating for is creation ex nihilo, right? So he seems to be missing what you're getting in, in verse 16 of Colossians 1. For by him, all things were created in heaven on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things are created through him and for him. So, so some of the things that are distinct about the biblical account of creation um, well, for the, the biblical account in general is, is that God does create material things out of nothing. That is, all, all things that came into being came through him. And, and secondly, the, there's no battle. There's no cosmic, cosmic um, um, sort of ebb and flow. The, there's, he, he has always existed he is the only thing that has always existed. And there isn't a, um, a, a, a parallel force or, or disorder that has existed along with him. Um, he bring things, he bring, brings things into being and then orders them. And you're not getting a sense of tension. Um, 
with him and nature in any way. Uh, so, so one of the things that strikes you when you compare these other ancient Near Eastern myths with with the the Old Testament story is his and Levinson acknowledges this uh, is his mastery, his absolute and total mastery over over those forces. Um, that's the word he uses, which which I I think is is um, useful and 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 on the money. Um, it's interesting, Isaiah, for, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he's God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. That's Bohu. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord is, and there's no other. So, so it, it is useful to remember that creation isn't just about bringing matter into existence. It's not just from going from no stuff to stuff. It's also, so that's, that's Aristotle's material cause. In, in the creative act, God is also responsible for the final cause or this teleological cause, right? It, it, he creates for a purpose. There's, a, there's an end to which creation is pointed, right? Um, and it is created in him and for him, as we, as we saw in Colossians. So, we don't we don't want to lose that. And and these ancient Near Eastern myths seem to be um, um, saying something similar to that. there there is there is a, a, a carving out of function in in the in the cosmos that God is doing. Um, more and on it's, and it's also it's also linear, which will separate it from a lot of. Uh, religions of the world uh linear versus say um cyclical like a yeah yeah uh, eastern yeah. eastern religions yeah so I, I i've probably talked about this with you guys before um this is proverbs 8 which is referring explicitly to wisdom but all of the the early church fathers when it was seeing particularly this part of proverbs 8 saw christ immediately and it saw the word in action, saw so this this order word that is holding all things together, and is is the is responsible for the creation. So the Lord possessed me. This is wisdom at the beginning of His work, the first of His acts of old, ages ago. I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths. I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water. So so you're seeing a kind of priority right over of the logos here prior to the springs abounding with water, before the depths, right? Um, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, before he, he had made the earth with its fields or the, the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. There's a kind of temporal priority and an additional uh, a kind of ontological priority. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, I see, I see math language in this, right? So he, draw, he draws a circle on the face of the deep. He's putting boundaries on it. When he made firm the skies above, when he established the foundations of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his, in, in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. Right. So you're seeing you're seeing a, a the, the, the role that the logos plays in ordering the creation, first of all, as priority before all of these sort of spooky things like the deep and all these waters but his absolute command and mastery over them. He commands, they don't overstep, they don't transgress, right? He marks out the foundations, he limits them. Um, and, and at the climax, he, he is the delight of the father and rejoices in his in, in the inhabited world. He rejoices in a world that's full of things and in particular in man, right? Who is who is at the, at the pinnacle of creation? Um, yeah, question, Walt. So, what I'm hearing is, um, you know, the pagan understanding of creation is kind of a combative one, where different parts of creation are 
trying to conquer others. Uh, the Old Testament view is more of a boundary ordered one. Uh, that's that's speaking in past tense. God created, God set things in order. But floods happen, and and how did they how did they understand that? Was it uh, you know in in the pagan view of, of kind of a combative creation? Is it one side is rising up and defeating the other uh, from a Old Testament perspective? What is the understanding for floods and things? It, the in the case of the uh, well, I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Are you asking if the um, if the there's an ebb and flow in terms of the control there in those ancient Near Eastern? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. That's, that's yeah, good. yeah. You're you're giving yeah some the, that that kind of tension is is ongoing um, is ongoing there, right? So the the verses. Versus what you're getting here, um, you have absolute sovereignty in the in the Old Testament, where when the flood happens, the flood happens only because God is allowing it to happen. It's not because something is rising up against Him. There, um, God so it's not so much that that uh, creation was flawed or that God was was uh, asleep at the switch. It's it's more that right. ebb and flow. It's it's generally ordered and boundary, but sometimes, I mean, I, I'm not talking about the Noah's flood, but more just if I'm, you know, living in, in, in my hut by the side of the river and there's a lot of rain and it floods, you know, would I understand that as that's what happens when there's a lot of water or? or yeah. Water? Yeah. And one of, one of the things Levinson does that's, in, that's interesting is he, the way he thinks about the problem of evil is he sees, he sees chaos as a, as, a kind of manifestation of evil, but he also sees it in in sinful men, right? So, what, what when man sins, that's a manifestation of that disorder. And God, in, in the same way that God is ordering the waters, He's also providing order for us in our disordered state, right? So, so He is He's trying to order us in in our hearts, um, and and providing providing a place where we can live in a kind of order and harmony with him. Um, he, he sees those themes in the Old Testament, and that's what a lot of the covenantal theology that you see there is. Um, so um, I, I wanted to finish with just the way Tolkien talks about some of this. So, so Tolkien hates al allegory. Um, and so he says in, in, in allegory or creation myth that these natural objects are arrayed with a personal significance and a glo and glory by a gift, the gift of a person of a or of a man. The idea is there. He, so he's reacting against that. So in these creation myths, you have these natural phenomenon, stars and moons and suns and sea, and they are given a gift by men in allegory. Right. They're they're given they're they're made into persons by human beings. And he's suggesting a kind of alternative. He says that, okay, God is the one that creates, but we men are sub-creators. And what sub-creators do are we develop new literary worlds, bringing form to what's already existent or extant. Right. So he says, liberation from the channels that the creator is known to have used already is the fundamental function of subcreation a tribute to the infinity of his potential variety, one of the ways in which it's exhibited. So, so he's thinking about writing. He's thinking about writing fantasy stories that, that rather than take natural phenomenon that were created by him and ascribe personal personality to those natural phenomenon and telling a story about those natural phenomenon by giving them personhood. That's man assigning personhood and glory to those natural um, phenomenon. He thinks what we do is God makes those national, natural phenomenon and we take those natural phenomenon um, as such and then build worlds out of them, build, build 
new worlds of fantasy on top of them. That's what sub-creation is. In doing so, then, you are participating in the divine character. And so he says the Gospels, when he use, uses fairy story, this is this kind of example of sub-creation. This is the, the positive term. So the Gospels contain a fairy story or a story of a larger kind, which embraces all the, the essence of all the essence of fairy stories. They contain many marvels, particularly artistic, beautiful, moving, mythical, in their perfect self-containing significance. And among the marvels is the greatest and most complete conceivable eucatastrophe. I had to I had to look that up. A eucatastrophe is a is a sudden, glorious ending to to a, a seemingly terrible situation. Right. So eucatastrophe is a good thing. It's a it's this sort of reversal of the catastrophe in a dramatic way but this but this story has entered history and the primary world that, that is the gospel so he's describing it he's describing to it as hi history not allegory the desire and aspiration of subcreation has been raised to the fulfillment of creation the birth of christ is the eucatastrophe of man's history the resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. This story begins and ends in joy. It is preeminently the inner consistency of reality. There's no tale ever told that men would rather find was true, and none which so many skeptical men have accepted as true on its own merits. For the art of it has the supremacy of convincing tone, has the supremely convincing tone of primary art that is of creation, to create it or to reject it leads either to sadness or to wrath. So, so what you're doing there is you're taking the, the history, you're taking the creative work that God has done, things that have actually happened in the world. And we, the, so for someone like Tolkien, who's going to write the Lord of the Rings or Lewis, who's going to write uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, for example, the, these are his this is what he thinks is sub-creation, right? This, the, that you're building new worlds on, based on the infinite variety of things that God has pre, uh, provided us to work with. Um, I, I, well, I'm interested in this because I wonder if, if engineering can be a form of that in some way, um, if, if engineering is a kind of creating of new worlds, um, in, in ways I, I probably have talked about this before so the the elves in the trees in tolkien's world uh are doing something like this they're taking that which is which is already good and made and beautiful and rather than destroying the trees cutting them down and building houses they build within the trees and somehow the trees are made better more glorious something like that they're 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 living with the trees in harmony and um and rather than harming them there's a kind of enhancement or or a place in which they the the elves can live um i'm, I'm going on too long but i i should i should stop and allow you to ask questions but um that's that's the 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 contrast that Tolkien makes with with allegory and the kind of myth making you see in the in the those ancient Near Eastern myths. Well, I'm certainly glad you cleared all that up for us, Walt. Uh, <laughs> I'm good. I have no further questions. Speechless. Yeah. <laughs> so, in in a sense, the. Uh, the the Lewis fables, the Lewis stories, <laughs> come into being in parallel with Tolkien's vision here. Yeah, yeah, I think they're up to the same. <laughs> thing. Yeah, they're 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 uh, in 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 writing these fantasy stories. You're you're create you're sub creating. You're bringing new worlds um, into being, and in in so much as you're doing that, you're participating in the divine nature. Mm -hmm. which is what, Paul talks about it in, uh, in, in one of the pastoral pieces. Coming to Christian reality on the back of a motorcycle, I think it's called. <laughs> wow. I, 
I don't know. It seems like it's splitting hairs, though. To, I, I'm just not getting my head around the distinction between what Tolkien is saying and then his rejection of allegory. It, I, it kind of feels like splitting hairs. Am I off in the wrong direction here, Walt? Maybe. Uh, I don't. I don't know. He what what he's pushing back against is the idea that. He's really he really is thinking, I think, of these ancient Near Eastern myths but or, or the Greek myths where you're taking. So, so you find yourself you find yourself in the world and you find all these natural objects, stars, water, the sun, things like that. And you tell a story that ascribes personality to them. Right. So so the, you, you, the planet Mercury is given Mercury is given a, a, a personal name and there's a there's a god associated with that so that is man bringing personhood to natural objects that's how he understands these myths and allegories like the 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 enuma elish is doing the same thing right so you've got the you've got the subterranean waters the fresh water that's apsu you've got the salt water that's tiamat so so they are taking these natural things and giving them personality, ascribing personality to them and giving them glory. And what he says is only, he's a good Catholic, right? So he's a, he's a strong creation ex nihilo guy. Everything that exists has been created by him. So, so if you want an explanation where these things come from, they're not, they're not persons that are, that are, that have been battling or something personal, um, gods that have that have been battling and and that's how we explain where creation comes from creation comes from god and his bringing things into being out of nothing and then what our role is is rather than trying to provide an allegorical explanation for what's going on our role is to take what he has made and make new things from it make new things with it mm. and so so the lord of the rings is sort of taking what we see in reality and building a kind of new world with it, right? So in, in, in Tolkien's creation account, that's what the, the, um, the, he creates, the, uh, um, Iluvatar creates, if you like, angels, and the angels are allowed to create the elves, right? So they're, they're sub-creators and, um, the, the elves are, are, um, sort of look at the these gods and and love them um the, the or these angels and and sort of grow to love them and give glory to, to iru so if you read the silmarillion a lot of this the way he thinks a creation story or or, or a, a world ought to be built is 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 an example there or the lord of the rings and i think about it in terms of engineering uh for my students when when we're taking the world that exists and using it for this is going to sound negative but i don't mean it so we we use it to our own ends and um those ends are for his glory and for our good right so so if you're if you're doing biomedical engineering you can you can be pushing back against the effects of our brokenness and and the curse by doing taking what already exists and creating new things with it that are for his glory and our good that's um that's that's what i how i see engineering it's it's a kind of it's a non-literary kind of sub-creation that's very helpful thank you so i'm thinking in uh, revelation 21 um uh, i saw a new heaven and a new earth the first and the earth passed away, and the sea was no more. Was was that that phrase? You know, the sea was no more. It's interesting. There's no mention of any other aspects of creation. Was that because the sea was seen as kind of the the um, the, the main figure of chaos or something like that? Yeah, I, th I think there's some. That's that seems right to me. Yeah. So the sea was no more. So this thing that had been had been scary that's that's this kind of disorder that's being held at bay no longer exists mm -hmm. well shall i shall i close us tim
Yeah. I guess. Uh, any other comments or questions? Thank you. I, actually, I have, I have another question. Well, is this uh, is this discussion happening in you know the present, either either within uh, you know um, faith scholars or or other you know philosophers and things? Is this an ongoing or, or um, a resurrected, if I can use that word, um, you know, topic of discussion? Um. Subcreation or or the ancient Near Eastern myths? Yeah, it's just the whole um, order and chaos and stuff. Uh, yeah, is that? Yeah, so yeah. I think my sense is that for the past hundred and fifty years, um, ancient Near Eastern literary scholars, Bible scholars, have been wrestling with trying to understand the relationship between these ancient Near Eastern myths and the Old Testament and the ways in which one is is speaking into the other um uh, my 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 inclination is to uh, i i want to push back against any notion that that so so last week i tried to push back on the notion that the 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 new testament or or trinitarian theology is is a derivative of Pythagorean cosmology or Plotinus or something like that, that, that the Trinity is is being derived from the, those Pythagorean or, or, or Neoplatonic ideas. And similarly, I'd push back, I'd be inclined to push back against the idea that, that what we're getting in the Old Testament is sort of derivative from um, the, these ancient uh, Babylonian and Canaanite myths. Um, but, but that, so, so I'm taking a pretty uh, a more theologically conservative position on on those those questions um, and and ascribing a kind of uniqueness to to the Old Testament and New Testament accounts. Um, but but that debate is or I, I I mean I'm not in the literature, but but that debate has been sort of central. It seems to me to uh, Old Testament scholarship for a hundred years. Thank you. Yes, if you could close this in prayer. Okay. And, and, and make it a good one because it's got to last till September. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's pray. So, so Lord, perhaps we, we, we won't we be seeing each other for some time, but uh, we, we're always grateful for your continued and ongoing presence, um, not only in, in terms of cosmic realities, but also in the microcosm of our own hearts and lives, uh, that, that you are sovereign over him and me and, and uh, Ted and all of us that are here. Um, and because of your wisdom, that can grant us peace uh, because we know that, that that word who is raised from the dead is reigning at the right hand of the Father even now. So take us from here with that peace to make it known to others and to show in small ways the kingdom of God in, in this world of brokenness. We ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord willing, hopefully we'll uh, reunite next June with you. So. Okay. So September 5th. All right. See you in September. Yeah. That'd be a good song. It's been a pursuit. Who's, uh, who's starting us off? Do you have someone to start us off in September? Uh, I just sent out emails. Uh, I'm not sure about September. Daryl Pearson has been there September for a lot of years, but uh, it's been kind of trying to discern what he should say yes to and what he should say no to. So if he can't, would you be interested? Daryl Pearson, he was a um, youth ministry, uh, chair of youth ministry at Eastern. Uh, Coast Guard. 
Yeah, okay, that's that's some some there. Do I have another? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was before uh, what's the guy that is now at uh, yeah, the College uh, of Western Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, uh, the character guy. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He was he was Yeah, he was. He just retired about a year or so ago. So he, I say for eight or ten years, he was well. I think he was in the youth ministry department. It used to be really big and it was just shrunk down. So, so I'm not sure. I haven't heard back from him yet. If you guys are still still yearning for uh, discipline yeah. Bible study, uh, yeah. we're still carrying we're still carrying on on Wednesday mornings at seven o'clock at Moody's. No quit, you guys, huh? No quit. Thank you, So there, there's no quit. Is that the Moody's in uh, Stratford there, Ted? Uh, yeah, out two fifty two out by Gateway. Okay. We're about seven o'clock. We're finishing yeah, up on Romans and then go to Habakkuk in a couple uh, of weeks. Hold on, uh, the the nudies that's on Lancaster is or the one sweet. No, it's on. It's, it's okay. technically on, on two fifty two. Yep. Right by that Wells Fargo. I know where you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have a great summer, guys. What do you do with the leftover donor bones? Feed them to the dogs? No, uh, Craig, you should take some over to the office. Uh, or what do you have another use for them? No, no, no. I was just wondering whether they're going to go to waste. No, no. They, the, I think the staff works through them over the course of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'm glad. How are you, Jonathan? Great to see you. Oh, nice. Okay, getting back, hopefully. Good. Slowly. Yeah. Slowly, but surely. Yeah, you know, don't use that as a crutch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Hit him with it. Hit him with it. Yeah, him. Hit the wacking. He deserves it. Uh, so, so we'll give you a donut hole for the road. Will Will you go up for Gary's funeral after after he dies? You think? I'm yeah, sure. Uh, I'm in country. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm thinking of trip to trip. I think it's fun. It's bigger parties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just did my friend across Kansas. You go through from the Colorado state line to the Missouri River on that. Okay, then thank you, thank you very much for the initiative. When do you go to Germany? Pardon? When do you go to Germany? Uh, end of the last week in August and the first week in September. And then in the middle of July, I'm going to be gone for about three weeks visiting. Mutual friends and relatives of family okay. in uh, Massachusetts, eastern Massachusetts, on the coast mm -hmm. in Maine. That's what he's relatives there. Good. Good. We made that almost an annual trip. Nice. Nice. Take care. See ya. I know, I know that. Is, that's the question we ask. Oh, I think we get water after that. Water can figure it out. <laughs> we can figure out the mathematics. Why? Why Sally hangs out with you? Why what? Why Sally hangs out with you? Oh. <laughs> Why she tolerates you? <laughs> that's a that, that's a, an 